Well, hello. <laughs> Let's do this again, right? <laughs> um, feel like I was just here. So um, I'm going to uh, tell you a little story. While I am doing that, I would like you to pull out your phones, and if you have not already, download the Ancestry mobile app so you can access it for both iOS or Android. But I'm asking you to do that now because as we get a little further in the presentation, I actually want to walk you through something, and I want you to be able to follow along if possible. So whether you're watching here in the hall or at home, um, if you'll just download that app while I share this story so that you're ready to go and we can all have a little fun together. Deal? Let's go. Okay. In the summer of 1942, World War II was raging across Europe and the Pacific Islands. Six months earlier, the United States had entered that war officially on the day that we'll live in infamy. In factories and shipyards across America, women went to work to support the, the effort by doing the jobs of men who had been called off to war. Sitting behind a clerical desk at Douglas Aircraft in Los Angeles, 19-year-old Doris was no Rosie the Riveter. She came to work each day with her brilliant red hair done up in the rolls and waves and pomp of the day. Her knee-length skirt was pressed and starched, and the seams in her stockings ran in a perfectly straight line up the back of her leg. For someone raised in the height of the Great Depression by parents who were poor dairy farmers and not so great with what little money they had, this job must have been something new and exciting. Now, during the war, Douglas Aircraft processed nearly, er, um, produced nearly 20% of the airplanes that were used in the war effort. The facility where Doris worked on Ocean Park Boulevard, just north of the Santa Monica Airport, was covered in camouflage that summer to avoid detection from enemy air forces. In fact, all the Douglas facilities in the Los Angeles area were covered, which was tricky because at the same time they were trying to avoid detection by enemy air forces, they were also trying to expand the size of their facilities <laughs> because they needed to account for the fast growth required to ramp up production on more planes. An effort that would, within just a year or so, employ more than 160,000 people. One of those people was Grace. Grace was a 25-year-old single girl with a flair for the dramatic who quickly became one of Doris's best friends. Doris called her Gracie, and Gracie called Doris Red. The ongoing construction that summer of the one million square foot aircraft assembly building and the special projects building used for classified projects by the Navy meant that architects, draftsmen, engineers, various construction personnel, and government inspectors constantly needed access to blueprints and exterior elevation drawings and shadow diagrams and floor plans and landscape designs. The hundreds of pieces of 24 by 36 paper required to detail a construction site of this magnitude were carefully cataloged and secured in a file room. When one was needed, it had to be ordered, pulled, and signed out. When it was returned, it had to be signed back in and refiled. Red and Gracie had the tedious, but not very physically demanding job of managing that process along with the rest of their regular office duties. Now, with so many of the young men their age off to war, and so many of the young women their age working at the very physically demanding job of aircraft construction, Red and Gracie appreciated that they worked together in a mostly quiet, mostly orderly environment where dozens of men <laughs> were coming in and out of the office each week to check files in and out. They admired, they flirted, and every once in a while they caught a glimpse of a kid that seemed to be a little closer to their age than the rest, and he had what Red described as a very cute butt. My mom told me I couldn't say that at Roots Tech, but too bad, mom. <laughs> Some tedious jokes can be delightful. Some tedious jobs can be delightful if you have the right kind of personality. And Gracie did. She was a delightful jokester. She could make just about anything fun. Red was more of a practical sort. She took great pride in a job well done. She appreciated efficiency above all else. She also had a brain that just naturally kept track of random statistics. For example, 
which of the men on the job site placed large pull orders or repeated pulls of the same files over and over? And one name came up a lot. Fred C. One day, in a fit of frustration, while tucked back in the filing room, she must have said something loudly to Gracie about the inefficiency of this Fred C. Why was he endlessly checking so many things and in and out, the same files over and over again? Couldn't he just get what he needed, get the job done, and move on to the next thing? And he, he must have overheard her. Fred was a 20-year-old draftsman, an artist with a brain for all things mechanical, who worked in the engineering department at Douglas. He had a baby face, a twinkle in his hazel eyes, and a notorious penchant for teasing. Though his father, a World War I veteran, was the head of the local army recruiting office, Fred had not joined up immediately, but had instead registered for the draft and entered that period of anxious waiting for his number to be called. Shortly following Red's rant, he came into the office to drop off another stack of papers to be filed. But this time, he sought her out personally, introduced himself as Fred C., handed her a bottle of Coke, winked, and walked away. As he did, her jaw dropped when she realized that not only had he overheard her, but he was the kid with the cute butt. After several weeks of flirting and Coke bottles and teasing, he finally asked her out. Fred Cowan and Doris Mulliner were married the next summer, July 25, 1943. Seven months later, he enlisted at Fort MacArthur to serve for the remainder of the war. She continued to work at Douglas. She bought a house less than two miles away from work and found a few roommates to help her pay the mortgage while he was away. She didn't even tell him she'd bought a house. And she had it paid off by the time he got home from the war. When he came home, he got a job in city planning with the city of Los Angeles. They had four children over the next eight years. They moved from Santa Monica to a new subdivision in the valley. They celebrated 57 years of marriage before Fred died. She lived another 18 without him. But almost every single time that I visited my grandmother in those 18 years, she would talk about the boy with the cute butt who brought her Coke and teased her and everyone else and built a life with her that she loved. Now, we talked yesterday if you were around, and if you weren't, go, go watch it on video. It was recorded, okay? Um, we talked yesterday about story keepers and how I had this opportunity in my family to become a story keeper. And I did. My grandmother would, I would ask her, tell me the story of how you and Pa met. I called them Ma and Pa. I was the oldest grandchild, and I couldn't say Grandma and Grandpa, so they were Ma Ma and Ma Pa. <laughs> And then it just got shortened to Ma Pa and the other 11 grandchildren followed suit, <laughs> okay? Um, and so I would ask her, tell me how you and Pa met. And she would tell me some version of pieces of that story. She never once told me that entire story in the way that I just shared it with you. Sometimes she'd talk about working at Douglas with Gracie. Sometimes she'd talk about the boy with the cute butt. Sometimes she would talk about how he just kept bringing her coke and flirting, but he wouldn't ask her out. <laughs> and then he finally did, and then she realized he was already dating somebody. I didn't even include that, <laughs> right? And then she thought she was too young to be in a serious relationship, and then there was the war, and he was going to be drafted. Little pieces of that story came out throughout my life. And then in those last 18 years, as I made a concerted effort to go and spend time with her more often so that she wasn't alone, um, I would ask her, tell me the story. And she would tell a version of it. And then as she got later in her life, sometimes she would forget she had just told it to me, and I would say, tell me the story. 
and she would tell it again, sometimes in the same phone call or same visitor conversation. And then, as she got a little later in life, and her memory started to slip, I discovered this really miraculous thing. I would pull out my phone, and I would pull up my music app, and I would start playing big band music. And instantly, her memories would return. And I would say, tell me the story. I heard that story in various ways so many times in the 40 some odd years of my life before she passed away that I have become the keeper of that story. That story is so deep in my heart that I probably could have told it to you without reading it, but I wanted to make sure I got it right. Because I also wanted to make sure that when I'm telling that story, that I get it right. And that people in my family who are watching can hear the story of Red and Fred and how they met and fell in love in the middle of a war. So I want you to think about the stories that you've heard in your life, all the little pieces of the stories that you have heard, and see if you can start to in your brain, or maybe on a notepad, if you have one handy, or in your notes app on your phone, maybe start to just list out, okay, this is the part where you have to participate. I'm not just standing up here today, <laughs> okay? I want you to start maybe listing out what are some of the stories that you have been the keeper of that you could tell. Is there a love story somewhere? Maybe yours, maybe a parent's or a grandparent's? Is there a story of an epic family vacation? Good or bad? <laughs> Is there a story of a family heirloom that you inherited? Is there a story of bravery that someone in your family tree exhibited? Do you have someone in your family tree who is an inspiring woman? Just jot down, as I say those things, what kinds of stories that you have heard over the years come to mind. One of the first things I want to teach you about being a good storyteller is that you need to capture the information when you can. Because memories are faulty, right? And ours will be too someday. Ours may be now. <clears throat> and so here's what I do. It's a little storytelling exercise. It's called Homework for Life. It sounds ridiculous. Um, I learned it from a, a master storyteller. And basically what they did is Every day at the end of the day, they would just write a couple of words or a sentence about something that happened that day. Just once in a little spreadsheet, okay? And then when you need a story to tell, a story about your own life, a story about something that happened to you, a story about your family, you have some of those key words to just trigger those memories. And so just write them down, okay? So here's the thing. A lot of people think, oh, well, I'm not a storyteller. <laughs> I thought that for a long time. And what I realized was every one of us is a storyteller. Storytelling is an innate part of the human experience. That storyteller is just kind of waiting to be released, I think. <laughs> and so I'm going to give you some tools to release it. Number one, write some things down. And write them down when they come to you. I keep a note. Um, in my note app on my phone of stories that I remember, things I hear my grandmother saying, or my Uncle Carl, or my mom, or when I was sitting around the, the table, the picnic table at the family reunion and listening to people swap stories, or the things I heard when my mom and dad and I walked into my mom's family reunion in Arkansas back in the fall of 2019, and she hadn't been there or seen those people in years, and all of a sudden, just memories came pouring out, and I was like sitting in the corner with my phone, typing as madly as I could, just keywords to remember, because I wanted to, to remember to ask my mom, or I wanted to remember to send an email to the cousin and get more of that story. Those stories are constantly all around us, and the storyteller in you that exists will be able to tell those stories if you just pay attention 
to how they're, they're around you and then how they can come out of you. So I announced yesterday that Ancestry has just this week released a new product called Storymaker Studio. If you've been over to our booth, you've seen some examples of that. And if you have downloaded the Ancestry app, you should now see it in your Discover tab. So in the Ancestry mobile app, in the Discover tab, is where you're gonna see stories that other people have created so that you can get some ideas and some inspiration. And that's also where we're gonna create a story. Not yet, I mean, you can if you want to, but we'll do it together here in just a minute. Here's what I'd like to do first. So I just told a love story. I would like you now to tell a love story. So it can be the love story of you and your spouse, it can be the love story of your parents, the love story of one of your sets of grandparents, pick one. And I want you to think, if you had to tell that story in two words or less, what two words? My story would be cute, but... My parents' love story would be blind date. I have a, a friend and colleague that I work with. I ran her through this little exercise I'm running you through because I wanted to make sure it was going to work. And her two words were baseball underwear. The two words don't even have to go together, <laughs> right? But don't you want to know more about that story? <laughs> okay, so pick your two words. Now I want you to turn to the person next to you or, and share your two words. I don't hear talking, people. It's the quietest giant room I've ever been in. Do I need to re-explain the assignment? Love story, you and your spouse or your parents or one of your sets of grandparents. Two words or less, there you go. Okay, anybody hear something amazing? Shout it out, I'll repeat it. What was it? Telephone booth. I wanna know more, okay? What else you got? Right here? Scout, scout hunt? Oh, scout hut. Well, that sounds way more interesting than a scout hunt. Okay. Anybody over here? Lunch line. Lunch line. Okay. Right here. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. I mean, was Daniel Radcliffe involved? I need to know more. Okay, so two things to keep in mind when you're coming up with a two-word story. Now, some of them aren't that exciting, right? Blind date, okay. High school, okay. All right. so if you can make your two words kind of intriguing, then that's good, right? Because here's what's happening to the modern world. Have you noticed that our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter? <laughs> okay? So if you can share your two words, you, met, you know, your dad and I met in a phone booth. That's a good story. <laughs> and now, if, then you watch, right? This is the key to being a good storyteller. You have to pay attention to your audience. And if they're like, wait, what? Now you have permission to tell the rest of the story. But if they're like, oh, okay, they're not in the mood. <laughs> they don't want to hear it. Maybe, however, you need to do it a little bit better. So now I want you to take that same story and I want you to put it into a, a single sentence. Write it down, type it out, for real, like do this, okay? Can you do it in one sentence? Go. How are we doing? You're just, you're just writing, like just handwriting or typing in your notes app on your phone, wherever. Just anything you, you've got handy.
Okay, anybody have a good sentence? What you got right here? Okay, you're going to have to maybe stand up and talk really loud. A civil war courtship. Which man? What just happened? Okay. What about right here? Lots of nervous people were at the lunchroom dance. But David was natural and collected, but naturally friendly. But David was naturally friendly. Now I need to know how friendly David was. Okay, what about one over here? I'm not interested in getting serious. I'm not interested in getting serious. Okay, see? One sentence. So maybe my one sentence from my grandparents' love story would be something like, the only man my age brought me Coke bottles and flirted a lot, but took forever to ask me out. <laughs> right? Here's my parents' love story. You ready for this in one sentence? Our first date was a blind date, and it was four days long. Okay. <laughs> my friend with the baseball underwear. When my mom was 12, she and her friend were at her brother's baseball game, and sitting in front of her was the older brother of another player, and all we could do was tease him because his underwear were showing the whole time. <laughs> okay? So think about how you would tell that, sentence, that story in one sentence and make it a little bit interesting. Don't give it all away, right? Maybe try to get a reaction. And again, here's your homework assignment, ready? Next time you're sitting around the family dinner table with your children or your grandchildren, I want you to just throw that sentence out. You know how grandpa and I met? Here's my sentence. <laughs> or have you ever heard the story of how your great-grandparents met, here's the sentence. And then what are you supposed to do? Stop talking and listen and pay attention. And if they're interested and want to know more, now you have their permission to tell the story. If they're not, let it go. And maybe try again another time. Here's what I have found in my family. And I do this with all kinds of stories. I just kind of tease them out and I tease them out and very often, they're not interested. They're like, oh, there goes Krista again. But every once in a while, here's, what's hap here's what happens. I drive down I-15 through Utah County with my nephew in my car next to me. And he goes, hey, didn't you say once that we're related to the guy who helped found Lehigh? That's weird we live here now, huh? Yeah, it is. Well, what else do you know about him? Now I'm in, <laughs> right? Now I can tell him all about my third great-grandfather, his fourth great-grandfather, who immigrated from Scotland in 1830 to Canada because he didn't have enough money to get to Australia, <laughs> and how he ultimately ended up in Utah, and there was an underground spring, and he wanted to build a mill, and so he dammed up the, the, the underground spring, and he made a mill pond. And when you're driving between Lehigh and American Fork, south on I-15, you drive right past the Mulliner Mill Pond. <laughs> and yeah, funny we live here now. And then if he wants to know more, I can tell him more, because I have stories for days about Samuel. But if he doesn't, I stop talking. Because we need to not give them so much that they don't want to talk to us again. So one of the keys to good storytelling is knowing your audience. Okay, now you're still writing, handwriting in your notebook, typing in your phone, okay? Can you tell this story in five sentences? This is gonna take a little bit longer. Those of you at home, I hope you're playing along, okay? Y'all probably have a little better access to something to write on than the people sitting here in the room. Some of the people sitting here in the room are like trying to balance notebooks and type in phones. Some people are just sitting with crossed arms staring at me like I'm supposed to sing and dance. Not happening. Okay, five sentences. I'll give you a couple minutes.
almost don't want to interrupt you. Some of you are like really into this. I love that so much. One of the things you're going to discover is that sometimes it's more than five sentences, sometimes it's less. That's okay. Like five is just kind of a general rule. I see a question. Sure. You're ready. You're ready. She's ready to move on. Come on, guys. <laughs> so here's the thing about this part of the process. Um, sometimes we can just think it through. Some of you are mull and ponder kind of people, and you can just kind of chew on it in your brain and work it over and rework it and kind of think. Like, and that's great. If you can do that, that's fantastic. My brain has way too much happening in it, so I find there is something very. Um, and I, and I, I used to do this with my students. I taught at BYU for 20 years, and, and I would make them get out a pen and paper and like physically write things, because there's something about that tactile process that kind of just focuses things. Um, and even like, and if they couldn't think about what to write sometimes, just start writing words, just one word at a time, one word at a time, one word at a time, and just kind of like free form it, and what happens is, then all of a sudden you can take that one word and write a sentence, and then the next word and write a sentence. So, what's hard about this for some of you? Talk to me. What's up? You don't know what's next? Okay, how many of you don't know the story of how your parents met? Okay, a few of you. How many of you don't know the story of how either set of your grandparents met? Or one, like, or one of them? Okay, that is a little bit of a challenge. So here's what I didn't know. I knew she worked at Douglas. I knew Gracie was her best friend. I knew Gracie called her Red. I knew they worked in the office. I knew that she worked at Douglas, but I didn't know which Douglas facility. As a matter of fact, I didn't know until I went to write this story for this audience a few weeks ago. I didn't even know that there were like four Douglas aircraft facilities in the greater Los Angeles area. I just assumed there was one, and I thought that the one she worked at was the one that I knew, um, which was right by the Los Angeles airport. I knew that she, you know, thought my grandpa was cute. I knew that he used to bring her bottles of Coke. I knew that he took a while to ask her out. But I didn't know the, like, details exactly of how things kind of played out, how long from the time they met exactly till they got married. So I had to go look that up. I actually figured out which Douglas facility she worked at because I was looking for a photograph of my grandfather to share with you and, and found on his ancestry profile that years ago I had put his World War II draft card. And it listed his occupation as a draftsman at Douglas Aircraft and then the address on Ocean Park Boulevard. And that sent me on this internet search to find all of the different facilities for Douglas. I didn't know that that summer that they met, all the Douglas facilities had been covered in camouflage until I dove into the Los Angeles County archives and started finding photographs. I was looking for a picture of a Douglas facility to share and found all this camouflage covering. And so then that sent me on another search to go find the details of the story, right? So sometimes we just don't know details and sometimes we don't know enough details to make it sound like a story and that sends you on a little bit of a hunt to learn more. Sometimes the people that you need to ask are already gone, but they leave behind clues. Those clues come in the form of a draft card. They come in the form of a city directory that listed my grandma's address and then listed the girls that she had as roommates all living at the same address. They come in the form of newspaper clippings and little photographs, the photograph of her and Gracie. I wish I could have shared it, but um, a couple of the people in the picture are still alive, and I'd have to get their permission, um, of her with her little skirt and her, you know, her little leg kicked out with the seam of her stocking running up the back of her leg. Like, little details like that, they leave clues. And so sometimes you just have to go looking for the clues and gathering them up. But don't wait to write down the pieces of the story that you know until you know all the story. I had those little details of the story that she had shared with me over years written down in her notes, on my tree, on Ancestry. And then when I sat down to actually write a more formal story, that's when I went digging for some of those additional details, okay? What other things are you struggling with as you try to do this exercise? 
Yep. You what? What if I get it wrong? How many of you are afraid of tell, sharing a story because you might get it wrong? Do you think that ever stopped your grandmother? <laughs> I love it when people are like, well, my grandmother said, and I'm like, well, your grandmother's a dirty liar. No, I would, I would never say that to somebody, right? But our, our grandparents told us stories that I am sure were not 100% factual. As a matter of fact, in some cases, I have proved that they weren't 100% factual. But what if they had never told me any of the story at all? Then I wouldn't even have the pieces that I needed to go look to see if it was true or not true. I wouldn't have any of it. So don't, like, I know that there's this tendency, especially among genealogists, right? We have to have all the facts and all the proof and everything has to line up and we have to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Don't worry about it. As a matter of fact, here's one of the things that I have discovered in my family. As I start telling the story, oh, people will correct me. I told the lemon pie story yesterday. The first time I told that story, I got it all wrong. And my mom went, oh, that's not exactly how that happened. <laughs> and she corrected me. Okay, great. Now I know more. Nothing will get to the truth faster than sticking a group of siblings in a room. <laughs> and then just lob a little question in the middle of the room and watch what happens, <laughs> right? And it's not that the story is wrong necessarily, but guess what? Everybody has a different perspective. And sometimes you can blend those perspectives to tell a beautiful story, and sometimes you can say, you know what, I don't care what my sister remembers, I'm gonna tell the story my way. And that's okay too. Okay, I saw a hand right here, yeah. I'll repeat what she's saying, I promise. Okay. Okay, so she didn't know her grandparents, didn't know much about her parents. She's been collecting information about her mother's life, but it feels like just facts, right? So how many of you have those kinds of stories, right? Just facts. Well, that's fine, right? And you want to share what you have, but then her question really was, how do I inject some personal, some personal something into that? There's several different ways. Here's the challenge. As genealogists, sometimes we want to look way back in the past and tell stories about people that we don't have any context for telling those stories. And whose stories do we forget to tell? We forget to tell our own. We forget to tell the stories about the people that we knew. And so when we didn't know somebody, so for example, my um, dad's grandmother never knew her. She died uh, when my dad was a teenager, never had any, um, you know, emotional connection with her. Her husband was alive when I was born. I have memories of him. He used to drive a big old beat-up pickup truck through the streets of Los Angeles, and he didn't believe in stoplights. Just didn't think they should exist, I guess. Um, <laughs> And he only, I think he was missing part of two fingers on one hand, and he was a character. He was the narcoleptic one. <laughs> and, uh, and I have these memories of him, and then I hear my dad's stories of, of his grandmother, and trying to reconcile these two people together in my brain wasn't working. So I decided to not ask my dad, because my dad had a very specific memory of his grandma. So I went looking for other people who knew her, right? My dad's cousins, she was their grandma too. Some of her siblings and their children, right? What memories do you have of her? And I've started hearing now all these stories and I'm still collecting them. And so one of the things you can do for parents or grandparents that you didn't know well is think about who else might have known them that might still be around or might still have a memory. Can you reach out to them and ask them questions and get their pieces of those stories? And that will help, I think, inject a little bit of that personal memory in. Okay, and then the key is share the story, right? Don't keep it to yourself, right? We, again, genealogists, y'all, we do this. We just start writing and writing or we, we collect information, we build family trees, and then we don't tell anybody because I'm not done like family history's ever done. 
because the story's not good enough, because I don't have all the details, because I don't know if I've got it exactly right. But the key to becoming a good storyteller is to become a storyteller. Just start telling stories. And those stories will change over time. As you get more details, as you put things more in order, as new facts come to life, as people correct you, right? But get in the habit of sharing those stories. Here's the thing. Y'all have looked at tombstones that have wrong information, right? So even when it's carved in stone, it's not always right. Um, and I think we need to kind of get over that need for it to be exactly accurate all the time. Because, right, sometimes done, told, is better than locked away and lost forever. Okay? So um, let me just give you a few more tips about how to craft these stories that you're going to tell. They don't have to be big stories. So the first key is to know your medium. What that means is, is this a story that you're writing? Is this a story that you're going to publish in a book or a collage of stories or a whatever, right? Publish in a blog, be all formal about it. That's a very different story than we're sitting around the dinner table with your grandkids and you throw out a little sentence and they respond and you want to tell a story, right? You're not going to read them something you wrote. You're just going to tell them the story. That's very different than me driving down I-15 with my nephew in the car and him going, oh, hey, what about that guy? Funny you asked. I have a story I can tell you, okay? Now, that's also a little different than this. Everyone in my life, from my 10-year-old nephew to my 72-year-old mother, has one of these in their hand almost at all times. <laughs> As a matter of fact, while you were just doing the last exercise, my mother texted me and told me that I look lovely in this color. So thanks, Mom. <laughs> She's watching online. <laughs> okay? So, so they all have these little devices in their hands. And do you know what they're doing with these almost all day long? They're watching stories. They're watching stories on Instagram. They're watching stories on TikTok. They're watching stories on Netflix. They're watching stories on YouTube. Some of those stories are 20 minutes long. Some of those stories are 10 seconds long. They're scrolling through other people's lives. Now, what if you could go to where they are and put stories of their own family in front of their face? So then instead of scrolling through the stories of random celebrities or people doing stupid things on TikTok, they were scrolling through the story of how you and your spouse met. And they were scrolling through the story behind the grand piano that sits in your front room that you inherited from your great-grandmother. And they're scrolling through the story of your father's service in World War II. And they're scrolling through the story of the brave person that came across the ocean by themselves at age 14 and walked across the plains. <laughs> or they're scrolling through the story of the woman whose husband abandoned her and her two children, and she raised those boys herself on a dressmaker's salary as a single, well, divorced woman with a husband who didn't even bother to divorce her first before he married wife number two and humiliated her and she has a dressmaker occupation that she can do to support her family. And oh, by the way, that's your great-great-grandmother. What if the stories they were scrolling through all day were your stories? I think I would much rather my family was scrolling through those stories than the stories of total strangers. So I want to meet them where they are. I want to know what the medium is. And the medium for me, where I'm going to capture their attention the most, is going to be on that device that they're carrying around all day, every day. So I introduced Storymaker Studio yesterday. You should now have it on both your web browser version of Ancestry and in your mobile device. If for some reason it's not showing up, just right there when you open up your Ancestry app, come see us in the booth in the exhibit hall and we can see what we can do to fix that for you, okay? Um, but I want you to play around with it. 
click on things, see what happens. Now, there's a lot of stuff happening in the Storymaker Studio. The Storymaker Studio has a new thing. Well, it's an old thing. We just moved it into the Storymaker Studio because we want everything in one place. It's called Photo Lines. Uh, I was just across the street in my hotel room at the Marriott. And um, a friend of mine had flown up from Texas, and she was here with me all day yesterday. And her sister lives in Wyoming. And I was roommates with both of these women at different times in my life. The Wyoming sister was my roommate my sophomore year of high school. The Texas sister was my roommate when I was a young single adult and I moved here to, to Utah. And or when I was a sophomore in college, that came out wrong. Um, and I have never been with the two of them together. So Wyoming sister said, I'll drive in. So she drove in, brought her 12-year-old son with her and we were just over in my hotel room at lunchtime. And the Texas sister looked at the nephew, and the mom looked at the nephew, and they were commenting on how cute he was, because, you know, 12-year-old boys love that. <laughs> and the mom kind of bopped him on the nose, and she goes, yeah, he has his daddy's eyes, but I'm not sure where he got this nose from. And I looked at her sister, and I looked at her nephew, or the nephew, and I looked, and I'm like, his nose comes from his aunt, apparently, <laughs> right? And she went, oh my gosh, it does. <laughs> um, and so then I pulled up this photo lines in Storymaker Studio, and I said, look, you can do this in Ancestry. This is so cool. You can pull up a picture of somebody, and then you can pull up three other pictures of people, and you can compare facial features. And it's kind of a cool thing, because you can see he's got his daddy's eyes and his aunt's nose and his mother's smart attitude. Okay. <laughs> So that's one of the things in the Storymaker Studio. Another thing in the Storymaker Studio is now what we're calling quick tasks. So I don't know about you, but I've been using my tree on Ancestry for a very long time, uploading photos, uploading all sorts of things. But I haven't always been good about talking about who and what and where of the photo. Nothing is more frustrating than inheriting a box of photographs with no names on them. And I have a few of those. Like I go through some of my grandmother's pictures and I have no clue who these people are because she didn't label them. And that translates to the digital world as well. We've gotten in this habit of just uploading photos and never once talking about who, where, and when. So these quick tasks are gonna show you photos in your gallery on Ancestry that, don't, that aren't tagged with the name of a person, that don't have a date, that don't have a place. And if you don't know, guess. Sometimes you can guesstimate, right, which is, called, which is an educated guess, that, oh, it was about 1947, because look, it looks like little Jimmy is about four years old, and I know that he was born in this year, and so we're going to say this was in about 1947. And if you find out later that you're wrong, you can change it, just like the details in your story. And sometimes we can look at that and we can think, oh, that looks like grandma and grandpa's house. Where were they living that year? Oh, I think they were living in this place, and I'm going to write down this place. So you can adjust those facts as you go, but kind of starting to guess at least puts some kind of information on those. So that's in quick tasks. And then also in Storymaker Studio is where you're gonna find your media gallery. So the media gallery has always existed on the tree at Ancestry, but now you can just have this one entry place for all of this. You're also going to be able to upload audio now. You can upload audio from any device. You can record audio on mobile devices and have that go. So Practice telling your story. Just tell it. Tell the story. Record yourself telling the story. Save it. Now you know where it is. Now it's in your tree, right? And you can go back and delete it and record a new one if you don't love it, but get in the habit of doing that. So this is also where you're going to be able to then find um, the place where you can start to tell some of these stories. Share some of these stories in a format that your family can consume them. Um, so know the medium, right? And I think mobile is a really great way to reach the kids and grandkids that we're trying to reach. Another tip that I have for you is frame the shot. Now I'm going to give you both a metaphorical and an actual physical definition of this tip. I don't know if any of you are photographers or if you paid attention to the general session today, the keynote, um, and you know, learned a little something. I don't know if any of you have ever paid attention to how this works. My mom um, actually was an LDS church service missionary and her mission was to take pictures. 
and so she was a photography missionary, and she had the opportunity to um, submit photos that have been on the church's website and in the church magazines, and some of, I, I think one of them even showed up at General Conference once. There's a picture of my sister-in-law on the church's website for mental health. She loves that. <laughs> um, so I learned some things, or I have learned some things over the years from my mom about photography. And here's the thing. You always want to frame your shot, which means you want to make sure that, you're, that the picture that you're showing is telling the story you want it to tell. So what's in the shot matters. But you know what matters just as much? What's not in the shot, right? One of the challenges that we have as genealogists is we want to tell all the things. And then I went to this archive, and then I got on this website, and then I found this record, and this record says this, and this is over here, and they can't, nope, you lost me. <laughs> if I ask you what time it is, don't tell me how to build the clock. Just tell me what time it is. That's all your kids and grandkids want for now. And if you honor that, they may come back later and want more. But for now, what you put in the story and what you put out of the story are equally as important. So get, kind of get used to framing that shot. One of the things we've done for you in the Storymaker Studio is we've given you prompts. So instead of trying to tell the whole love story, tell us one thing about it. And here's the question to answer. So pay attention to those prompts and you might find you can do that a little bit easier. And then, and I love this particular step, because storytelling to me is, um, it's an interesting medium, and it's really easy to make myself the hero of every story. I'm amazing, guess what I did? Guess what I found? Guess what I remember? Nobody cares. It's not about you, right? So figure out a way that instead of trying to be the hero of the story, unless the story's about you, Right? Yesterday, I told you my ancestry story about how I became a genealogist. That story was about me. But the story I told you today about my grandparents, some of you may have suspected, but I was nowhere in that story until the next to the last sentence when I mentioned that she was my grandmother because the story wasn't about me. Think about all the great stories you've ever heard. Let's talk about stories in popular media, right? Katniss was the hero. Hamish was the guide. Luke Skywalker is the hero. Obi-Wan Kenobi is the guide. Mr. Banks is the hero. And Mary Poppins is the guide. Even though the movie is a, has her name in the title. Harry Potter was the hero. Hagrid was the guide. You thought I was going to say Dumbledore, didn't you? Okay? So I want you to kind of think about all those hero guide relationships that you've kind of seen in popular culture over time. And it's, I mean, that, it dates back in literature all the way. It's a very popular hero's journey concept when you talk about stories. And think about how you can be the guide. So that means you have to make someone else the hero. And heroes are inherently flawed. So when you start telling a story about your great-grandfather, he's not perfect. And it's okay to include some of those little flaws. Did you catch the flaw in the story I told about my grandparents? My grandmother was super frustrated with him. She thought he was really annoying <laughs> before she ever even met him. And he was an endless tease. They weren't perfect. I love them dearly, even now, but they were not perfect. And so heroes are not perfect. They have flaws, that they have things they have to overcome, right? And so think about that and don't always present perfection. Your children and grandchildren won't learn anything from that. We want them to learn some things. We want them to feel connected to these people. You feel connected to people when you can relate to them. And if you can't relate to them, you don't care. So we want to make sure that we show all those sides, and we get to be the guide through that story. Occasionally, see if you can figure out a way to make your children or grandchildren the hero in the story. Right? I, I'm super curious to hear 
how some of you take that piece of advice and what you do with it. As a matter of fact, will you just write down my Instagram email, uh, address? I'm just at Krista Cowan. So if you're on Instagram, you can find me that way. If you're on Facebook, you can find me facebook.com slash the barefoot genealogist. Okay? I love getting direct messages from y'all because I want to hear how you're taking this advice and I want to hear how you're implementing it. Um, so what does it look like for you to be the, be the guide? How, does that, how do you take that? Okay, so those are my three pieces of advice. Let's walk through building a story. So get out your app. When you open up the app, now across the top, you should see a little, we call it like a bubble ribbon. If you've been on Facebook or Instagram, you've seen these, right? Just little story bubbles across the top. You can, you can look at other people's stories if you want, okay? The stories across the top, are you seeing this, that have a little leaf next to them? What that means is that somebody wrote a story about somebody that's in, one of your, in your tree online. So somebody else has that person in their tree, they wrote a story about it. If there is no little leaf next to the little story bubble, it'll probably say something like, inspiring women, bravery, family recipes, right? So these are um, what we're calling our community stories. And here's how you can see the topics. On the far left there, do you see the little plus icon, the little green leaf plus icon? If you click that, it's going to open up a window that should look a little something like this. And if you scroll across the top there, you should see all the different categories. Heirlooms and veterans and family vacations, okay? I want you to find the one that says love story. And when you find the one that says love story, I want you to open it up. Lots of different categories there, but we're gonna focus on that one. Now, if you happen to have a picture of the couple that you had the love story about in your tree, all you have to do is click the little plus button in the middle of the screen. It will open up your media gallery in your tree and you can find the picture. If you don't have a picture of them, click the little plus sign and you can click then the big green plus sign in the bottom and it will allow you to find a picture that maybe you already have on your phone. You could also take a picture, like if your love story is about you and you're sitting next to your sweetheart right now, just take a selfie. That's fun, okay? Once you attach a photo, you then can start adding additional story slides. So you can tell a story about, um, you can actually type out the story. So what I did in my tree was I had typed up the story in my notes on my phone. I just copied and pasted into the story slide. So you can do that as well. Let me switch over to here for our last couple of minutes. Okay, so just kind of play with it a little bit and see how it all works. If you've ever created a story um, on social media, you know how this goes, but if you haven't, um, it takes a little bit of playing around with it to get used to it. So you can add a photo, you can add some words, you can add another photo, you can pull in a document, like I could add that document from my grandfather's World War II draft card. So if I've got that attached in the tree. So you can just kind of start pulling in different photos. You can type up different pieces of the story. You can have up to 12 slides in a story. But I'll tell you this right now, nobody's clicking through 12 slides. <laughs> I mean, maybe they will. But I have tried to keep all of mine like in the five and six slide range, okay? So you're just gonna play with it, create a story. If you want somebody to handhold you or help you walk through this, come over to the booth, the Ancestry booth. We have a whole team of people over there just waiting to show you your stories. We also have over there on the big screen monitors um, some examples of some of the stories that are being published this week by different people in the community. And if you uh, want, for those of you at home who don't have that opportunity, if you go to ancestry.com slash storymaker, Ancestry.com slash Storymaker. We've got a couple of videos here that will walk you through exactly how to do this and a couple of examples of some of those stories so that you can 
have all of that right there. So again, that's ancestry.com slash storymaker is where you're going to find that, okay? Now, once you get your story done, a couple pictures, some sentences, another picture, maybe another sentence or two, you've got your five sentences, you've pasted them into your story, you now have two options when you click done. You can publish the story or you can just save it to your gallery. Now, if you just save it to your gallery, you're the only person who will see that, you and the people who have access to your tree. If you publish it, it's gonna show up in that little bubble ribbon for other people to view. Now, why would anybody care about my grandparents' love story? Well, here's one of the things that I have learned about being a great storyteller. The greatest storytellers are those who listen to other people's stories. I have become the storyteller that I am because I go to storytelling festivals, because I watch YouTube videos where great storytellers tell great stories, because I sat by my grandmother's bedside over and over and over again for the last 18 years of her life because I listen to my mom and my dad tell stories around the family dinner table. I listen to them share a couple words or share a sentence. I watch people's reactions. And so, at Ancestry, we believe that if you can be exposed to great stories, that you'll get better at telling your own. So click through some of those stories. As a matter of fact, on the Discover tab in your mobile app, if you scroll down, you're gonna see a section about community stories, and you can pick one of those topics and you can go through and look for them, okay? And here's what I want you to do. At some point today, I want you to grow through some of those love stories and see if you can find mine. See if you can find my grandparents' love story in there and see exactly how I put it together. Now, the other thing you can do once you get there is you can like it. Please like me. <laughs> you don't have to, okay? Um, but you can like it. You can also comment on it. So if you have questions about it or something to add, you can do that. Um, I'll respond to you. I'm happy to do that, okay? But play around in this space and get familiar with it because then what you can also do, whether you publish it or just save it to your gallery, you can download a little movie of it to your phone, and then you can share it on your own social media. You can upload it to Facebook, you can upload it to Instagram if you wanna share it on those channels with your family and friends. If you do, please hashtag it, My Ancestry Story. You can also click the share button, and that you can send a text message to your nephews, and you can say, I just made a story about how grandma and grandpa met. And if you click this link, you can watch it. And they'll click that link. And instead of watching other people's stories go by, they'll be watching the stories that are part of who they are. Because there's a lot of stories that are coming at us all the time. Stories we read, stories we watch, stories we listen to. But more important than all of those are the stories that we get to live and the stories that live in us. The stories that we've inherited as part of our DNA the stories that we've inherited as part of our, our family culture. And the most important thing about those stories is how they connect us to each other. How every time I get to tell one of my nephews a story, our hearts are bound together. Thank you.